Deep Space Mission 2 coming up as well, Terry. Yeah, indeed. This is the thing that I am anticipating with terror and yeah. <laughs> um, enormous anticipation. It is probably the most complex mission uh, in, in terms of what actually all has to happen automatically that we have yet attempted. The James Webb Space Telescope is often regarded as the successor to the Hubble Space Telescope. Not quite. It will look at a completely different area of the spectrum uh, in the infrared for a, a number of reasons. For Basically because the further back you look in time, uh, the more you need to look into the infrared because of the redshift that has occurred with the light that is coming from these very, very distant galaxies. Not going into too much detail on that. Also, the infrared can uh, penetrate dust an awful lot better than uh, invisible light. So you look into the center of, of dusty uh, star forming regions, centers of galaxies and so on. Whole lot of reasons for this. It, it'll be absolutely fantastic if it actually all comes to fruition. Again, you'd need to sort of look up all, all the things that the JWST has planned to do. Now, to do that, it needs to get very far away from the Earth because the Earth actually radiates out into space at the frequencies that the uh, the JWST will be studying. Uh, it, it's actually an average temperature of about 30 degrees uh, Celsius. So we, we want to go, or Kelvin, sorry, Celsius, yes, <laughs> that we, we need to get well away from it. So it will go also to a Lagrange point, a stable point, the L2 point, well beyond the Earth. Earth. It needs to get out there and it also needs to deploy a very, very complex sun shield to protect it from the radiation from the sun. So uh, what you're looking at there does not look like a telescope at all. Basically, you can see part of the mirror there in the background, the octagonal um, shapes of the, the gold coated mirror. But an awful lot of what you're looking at there is sun shield. So let's go back to what stage it's at now. It was constructed in, um, mainly in California. It has gone from California through the Panama Canal uh, and across into the uh, Atlantic Ocean. It has arrived at uh, French Guiana, uh, where it's on its way to the uh, actual launch pad in uh, Kourou in French Guiana. And it will be launched on uh, a Ariane 5 rocket. Rocket launches are risky in themselves, as we know, things do fail, but assuming it gets into orbit and then starts on its way out to the L2 point, that is where what they call 30 days of terror begin because of all the operations that have to happen automatically for it to function when it gets there. I mean, it's, you, you can spend a whole couple of hours talking about this, but basically there are 40 major operations that have to deploy automatically one after the other for this thing to work. And some of them are so complex in themselves that it's absolutely mind boggling. It has to deploy its solar panels. There are a whole lot of explosive boats that have to fire to release things. There are cables to unspool. There are joints that have to operate. There are electrical, electrical systems to operate. The antennae to point. And this sunshade of seven layers, it all has to deploy. Otherwise, the telescope simply won't operate because it'll, the temperature will be too high. And just on that alone, there are 7,000 parts of that sun shield. There are 400 pulleys and eight motors and numerous cables, and it all basically has to unfold like a giant origami uh, to, to get the sun shield to deploy. Then you have the optics. The secondary mirror has to deploy into exactly the right configuration. And the main mirror, which is folded up at the moment because otherwise it wouldn't fit inside the rocket. It also has to deploy uh, the panels. Uh, basically, it's it's um, it's more or less shaped like a giant petal, basically. But the outer parts of the petal on opposite sides are folded in, and they have to unfold so that the mirror assumes its full six and a half meter diameter. And after that, then there are about thirty actuators that have to align those individual uh, panels of the, of the mirror absolutely accurately to fraction of a diameter of a hair accuracy otherwise, otherwise this thing won't work and the whole thing has to happen automatically over a period of 30 days and of course there'll be mid-course corrections to get it into exactly the right point when it arrives and if any one of those fails the whole thing basically fails it's, it's just as simple as that 
And they talked about the seven minutes of terror when the spacecraft were perishing died into Mars, uh, onto the surface of Mars. At least that's over fairly quickly. This will be going on literally for 30 days. And I think there'll be an awful lot of fingernails that are bitten away down to the bone. I'm sure you're you're anticipating it as much as I am. I, I have been for many years. So um, I was very fortunate to be invited to NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center uh, some years ago because I got involved after there was a, a plan by Congress to cancel the James Webb and an astronomer Heidi Hamill gave a talk at the NEEF conference in New York and I was there and on the back of that I came back and uh, I got a UK journalist involved in this as well and we set up a campaign called Save the James Webb a team in America and myself and I was the only Brit on the project oh the only non-American on the project got invited over by none other than John Mather himself who was like the, the PI on the project and got to meet people like Amber Strawn uh, as a result of that at, at Space Fest and other conferences Maggie Mazzetti various people who've worked uh, at NASA Goddard for many years incredible people got to see it in the kind of the build phases that were in some of the mirrors the thing as well Terry that most people don't appreciate this because it's so large it's never been fully tested it cannot be fully integration tested because there isn't a vacuum chamber on the planet anywhere big enough to do this. I mean, the second largest one or one of the largest ones in the world is at Goddard. That's huge. I mean, it's absolutely enormous. You see it in the flesh and you think this is huge. Obviously, there's bigger ones at some of the other NASA centers, and they still aren't big enough for this thing. I mean, these this is, you know, the test chambers that worked on Apollo that basically put the entire Apollo command and service module inside. It's still not big enough. This thing, the sun shield is the size of a tennis court. And as you said, it's got to unfurl. And anyone who's used a telescope, especially a Newtonian telescope, which has got mirrors, or a schmidt cassegrain telescope, will know all about something called collimation. Collimation is basically, if your mirrors aren't perfectly aligned, the image goes all wrong, all wrong, and you'll get, instead of pinpoint stars, you get little fuzzy kind of taily comet looking things. This thing has got to unfurl and collimate itself, as you said, down to micron level precision after being launched on an Ariane 5. Now, if you've ever experienced a launch, or know anything about launch um, testing. Basically, to test something for launch, you have to do what's called TVAC and shake and bake testing. So you have to thermally cycle it, you have to expose it to radiation, but then you also have to basically blast it with vast amounts of sound, like huge yeah, acoustic resonance, and also shake it. Because uh, when something's taken off into space, you, you know, you may have been fooled by SpaceX's glorious launches where it looks like they're almost taking a bus ride up into space. It's so it's so neat. And Ariane 6, or, sorry, Ariane 5, as it will be this time, um, 6 isn't quite ready yet. Uh, launching this thing, this is going to be shaking like a good one. Um, and the fairing, which is basically where the spacecraft, where the James Webb itself is being contained uh, at the top of the rocket, that's got to, there's so many things that's got to separate on time. The orbital insertion's got to be correct. The orbital trajectories, the burns to get out to the Lagrange point have got to be correct. All of this, it's, it's the most complex thing ever. And as Terry said, if it goes wrong, you can't fix it. Unlike the Hubble, which is only a you know, 400, 500 miles above us, uh, it's still you know, the furthest most humans have been since Apollo, but it's not that far above our heads, the Hubble Space Telescope for the servicing missions. It was always designed to be serviced by humans. You can't get to L2 with current technology. There is no way this thing can be serviced, uh, apart from possibly autonomously and robotically in the future, but it's only got a limited amount of coolant that's going to run out in a number of years. So this thing's got a finite lifespan, unlike the Hubble, where you could repair it and keep it going. The Hubble's now, you know, three decades in. This thing doesn't have that lifespan. So uh, and at $8 billion, <laughs> it's got to work. Um, I mean, it's interesting. We, we talked about this before. You've got between the James Webb and very soon after, you've got the Orion. Orion and uh, the Artemis missions to the moon. The Orion capsule is now basically being integrated into the SLS, the Space Launch System stack, which is going to be enormous. It's going to be practically the size of the Saturn V. Um, that's $12 billion. If we take that and the James Webb, that's $20 billion. That's a lot of money. And if the SLS goes wrong, God knows whatever reason, we hope it doesn't. If it blows up on the pad or something like that and the James Webb fails, you know, some people have even speculated that this could be not quite the end of NASA, but a really bad blow for them. So fingers crossed, please, everyone, fingers crossed that this thing, not only when it launches, but as Terry said, for several months afterwards, until it gets out there and it starts taking its first images, 
And don't forget what happened with the Hubble. The Hubble's first images were blurry, uh, you know, because Perkins Elmer factored the mirror. In, you know, the testing of the mirror was slightly out, um, and the you know machining of the mirror wasn't quite as precise. I mean, it's more precise than anything that had ever been built, but it still wasn't perfect, which it had to be. Um, and with the Hubble, they had to put the co-star on it and fix it with the corrective optics. There's no option here. If James Webb fails, it's gonna fail. So massive, massive finger crossed. <laughs>